My name is Katya Gutierrez and I was a Jehovah's Witness for 23 years. Christian and I escaped the Watchtower organization four years ago. The reason that we want to make this documentary is to bring awareness to the fact that the Jehovah's Witness organization destroys families' lives. We know of hundreds of thousands of other people just like us who've also had their lives destroyed and their families taken from them. These are their stories. My name is Nick French. I became involved with Jehovah's Witnesses from the age of six and left by the time I was 40. I resigned as an elder before I had turned 40. When I was about six years of age, um, having been born in Glasgow, uh, my mum left my dad and took me and my sister, who's only six months old, um, into Cheshire in England to a place called Knotsford and uh, one day she got a knock on the door and she opened the door this was in the kind of late 70s and uh, the person that uh, was on the other side of the door was ranting on about uh, the fact that if she didn't become a witness she would die at Armageddon she said do not call at this house ever again and then we moved house and somebody different came to the door <laughs> and this time she liked what she heard and became a Jehovah's Witness uh, and I was six years of age at the time so not long after that um, we went to go and visit um, my gran in Brighton she lived in a big apartment block and um, she said oh there's a, another Jehovah's Witness in our block you should go and see her so my mum went to go and see her, and she had a son who was uh, at that time single, took an interest that appeared in her, they started courting and eventually got married. Uh, so we moved to Brighton. Unfortunately he was a paedophile. So from the age of seven I was uh, the subject of his attention. Um, and he started grooming me from when they started courting, even before they married. Uh, as time went on, I would uh, say to my mum that he was beating me up, for instance. The elders would be called in, but it was my word against his, and nothing would be done about it. When I was about 13, um, I was uh, raped by him when the rest of the family were at a meeting at the Kingdom Hall and that was the last straw for me. I was obviously growing up a wee bit, uh, able to try and kind of fathom out what was going on. So the next morning I said to my mum that he'd been messing about with me. I'd never said what actually happened and um, he was confronted, admitted to it and that was the last that uh, we saw him. He was also disfellowshipped from the congregation. Uh, this was in Brighton. A couple of years after he'd left, he still wanted access to his son, my brother. Um, one day, uh, he came home from visiting his dad and said, I don't want to see my daddy again. Um, didn't say why, I knew exactly why. And I said to my mum, and she called the police. This was two years after I had initially disclosed what had happened to me. 
So the police came, they took statements from me, my sister, my brother, um, but my mum asked that charges not be uh, pressed against him. All charges were dropped and uh, he, all the police could do was caution him. So I was 15 years of age, pretty messed up. I was an angry, angry kid. Um, and yeah, I was, I was struggling. Um, I was a very, very lonely child. Not only because I was in the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses, but also because I was uh, being abused. And the abuser doesn't want the victim to associate with anybody. Um, for fear of, you know, that, that secret getting let out. Uh, and it was a mixture of emotional abuse. Um, he wouldn't call me by my name. Uh, there was physical abuse. Uh, I would be starved regularly, beaten regularly, uh, and sexual abuse on a weekly basis. But when I looked around the Kingdom Hall, I saw happy people. And I wanted to be happy. I just wanted to find happiness. I wanted to find somewhere that I belonged, that I could be loved. So uh, I was baptised at the age of 15 um, in a uh, swimming pool in Crystal Palace in London. Um, and yeah, I tried to be the best kind of Jehovah's Witness that uh, I could be. Um, I'm an all or nothing person. Uh, and so even at school, I was witnessing to, to everybody. At the same time, um, I knew that any day now I'd bump into my abuser on the street um, and I knew that if I did, I, would, I, I literally would kill him um, at the age of 17. So I realised that I could no longer stay in Brighton. Um, and my dad was still in Scotland. I phoned him one day and said, can I come and live with you? And he said, yes, yeah, great, great. My mum wasn't very happy about this. Um, she spoke to the elders in Brighton. Um, saying, you know, Nick's wanting to move in with his dad, who's not a witness. Um, so they started to, you know, question me about his morality and things like this. You know, is this really the best thing to do, to go and live with your, your father? Question his morality. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just because he's not a Jehovah's Witness. Yes, yeah. So, um, anyway, I didn't listen to them. I knew that I had to get out, and so I moved to Scotland. So I, I moved into a congregation in Stirling, uh, which is just um, about half an hour north of Glasgow. And I was 17. I had a really nice letter of recommendation from the, the congregation that I'd left. Uh, and I was welcomed with open arms. Um, I was the, the new kid on the block. Everybody absolutely welcomed me. And I thought, this is what it's about. I found somewhere that I'd actually belong. Um, I was appointed a minor civil servant quite quickly um, and started dating a girl. We were married at 21. At uh, 26, our first child came along. Um, and when she was born, everything that had happened to me in my childhood then came flooding back to me. Um, it was also around about the same time that um, my abuser was reinstated um, and I was starting to find things really, really difficult. When Gary was reinstated, it was down in the south of England. I was living in Scotland. The only reason I knew that he'd been reinstated is that my sister called me in a terrible state. She had been to the assembly and Gary was sitting right in front of her. And by this time she had a little child of her own. So she got up and moved to a different part of the assembly. He got up and moved to where she was. And she was 
really, really distressed. What? And did he remember who she was? Oh, he knew and he knew exactly what she, he was doing. Oh my goodness. So she went to the elders that knew about the case and said, what's going on? And they turned around and said, you need to move on, everybody else has. To her? Uh-huh. And um, she wasn't allowed to talk to anybody about it because it'd be causing divisions. But I had actually written to the elders in the, my previous congregation asking how could my abuser, his name's Gary, Gary Mosscrop, how could he have been reinstated when I've never heard from him, I've never had anything to say that he was sorry for what he'd done. How does a child abuser show repentance? Um, everything that they do is in secret. Yeah. Um, and I had no reply back. It got to the point where I was really, really struggling and actually I wanted to commit suicide. Um, and at that point, I then went to my doctor. Um, the, the night before, I'd actually driven out to a, a, a loch in Scotland and I was just gonna walk in and not come back out. And then I thought of my children and I thought, what if they thought it was something that they had done? Maybe it was they'd grow up wondering if it was because they were on the scene and I couldn't couldn't handle that. So I went to my GP, my doctor, and I said, I was abused as a child and I need help. And that was the first time in all those years that I had told anybody. Um, not even my wife knew about it. Um, so he referred me for cognitive behavioral therapy, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, the first thing that the therapist said to me is, you don't have to tell us anything that you went through. I'm just going to help you to have some coping mechanisms. So again, I never told anybody. Um, and that helped for a good few years. And I, I remember one time going out with um, the circuit overseer on the ministry. And um, I was telling him a little bit about the depression that I was coping with. And I had told him that I'd been to get therapy. And he stopped and looked at me and said, did the magazines not help you then? And I was kind of taken aback at that. This was quite a young circuit overseer who I thought would be, you know, understanding of what people go through. But no, he obviously thought that, you know, the literature, the organization produces everything that you need. You don't need to go to therapy. And they don't they don't want you to go to counseling. They don't they don't want to see a therapist because they say they say that, oh well, that's worldly advice. It's not coming from the organization. And they don't want anybody in the outside world to find out about it. Right. Because people like BCB uh, will be approached by the elders and saying, but you know, we'll deal with this, don't worry, we'll deal with this. Um, and they don't want anything to, to muddy uh, the name of Jehovah's Witnesses. I went to see various different therapists over the years um, because of insomnia, uh, flashbacks. Um, at one stage I was having about maybe 30 or 40 flashbacks a day. So like major PTSD. Or yeah, um, really, really tough. Um, and all the while I was an elder, I was helping other people. And all the while that I was an elder, I'd never felt that I was good enough um, to get through Armageddon. I, I never had, I never even envisaged that I'd be in paradise. I had no self-worth at all. Because of what, what you went Because through. of what yeah. I'd been through. One day I went online, because of the child abuse, I went online and I found a website that spoke about a database of paedophiles within Jehovah's Witnesses and suddenly I realized I wasn't an isolated case. Um, my uh, mum had always you know said well the congregation didn't deal with it properly you know if it was anywhere else it would have been dealt with properly. It was a situation. Yeah it was just my situation they hadn't handled it correctly you know, if it was anywhere else, it would be dealt with properly. Suddenly I realised that wasn't true. I've heard that same thing from my own mother. Yep. Yeah. So I thought, well, 
if that's not true, what else isn't true? And I was, uh, I was coming to a nervous breakdown with it all. And my wife had said to me, she said, well, Nick, what was it that attracted you to the, the truth in the first place? That's, you know, what we called it, the truth. Um, and I said, well, it was the prophecies. Uh, I absolutely love the prophecies, you know, working out all these numbers and things like that. She said, well, if that's what attracted you to it, maybe you should study the prophecies again. So I thought, that's a good idea. I thought, right, I'm going to really study the... And all of a sudden, <laughs> it didn't make sense at all. And when I started to do research, there was a book that had been re just released, um, a book about Jeremiah, I think it was. And there was um, an archaeologist that had been quoted uh, backing up the year 607. So I thought, I'm going to look up about this archaeologist. And I read some of this archaeologist's papers, and nowhere did he mention 607. And I reread the literature and realised that it had been taken out of context. And that for me was it. If I've been lied to about that, then none of it stands. Because that is a absolute, you know, fundamental doctrine. It's a key to the foundation of the organization, yeah. right? And I remember I phoned up my mum and I said, uh, Mum, I've just discovered that 607 is wrong. Watchtower say, using the year 607, nobody else uses the year 607. And she turned around, because she had remarried by this point, she said, Nick, I've never been good with numbers. You need to speak to Ray about that. And I said, but mum, this is your whole belief system. So that was that. I then uh, read the book, Crisis of Conscience. And so much of it resonated with me because I had been to so many elders meetings and I realized that what happened in the elders meetings obviously happens exactly the same in the meetings with the governing body and it's a corporation. Um, so that was it for me. As soon as my eyes were opened, I knew I couldn't go back. The, the trouble was that my kids were young and I knew that if I was going to be an apostate, that they would be turned against me. You know, I was worse than the devil. I had to make sure that my children knew, who were very young at the time, they knew that I wasn't a bad person. But I started to fade. The first thing I did was um, resign as an elder. So I had already stopped going for a while, saying that I couldn't cope and with depression. Um, I then resigned as an elder, but they didn't accept my resignation. Um, they said, just take time out and you know, you'll be fine. So immediately I left. Um, I had remembered as a child celebrating Christmas, birthdays, and I thought, my kids are gonna want to be doing this as well. So immediately, that was it kids were celebrating Christmas and birthdays. It wasn't something I forced upon them. I said, if you want to do it, I'm going to be doing it. If you want to join in, you can join in if you want. I'll give you presents. It's something that was important to me as a child. Um, so they quite enjoyed that. And oddly enough, my uh, wife quite enjoyed that they were being involved in that as well. The, the next day there was a knock at the door and it was two elders. It was one that had served alongside for years and years and another one that had moved in after I had left, I'd never seen before. And they said, we want to talk to you, Nick. And it was uh, December and I had a Christmas tree in the corner. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, you're not coming into my home. I said, I'll come to you though. When would you like to meet? So we arranged the meeting for the next day. And I went up to this elder's house and sat down and I said, well, can you tell me what this is about? And they said, well, uh, we hear you have a Christmas tree. <laughs> um, can you confirm this? And I said, um, can you tell me where you heard this from? And the two of them looked at each other and went, no, we can't tell you. And I said, well, if you can't tell me, I said, I'm not telling you what I've got in my house. And they said, you do realize that if you do have a Christmas tree, this is apostasy. And I just looked at the, the elder that I knew and I said, I know exactly where this is going. 
and this is futile. I'm not interested. This is a waste of my time. It's a waste of yours. I said, this meeting's over. And as I got up, they said, Nick, we, we really love you and we really want you to come back. And at that point, something inside my head just clicked. And I said to myself, I never want to hear those words again. And I don't want them to ever think that I will be back. So the next day, I just handed in my disassociation letter. Um, I never told my um, immediate family. So the police then opened up the case and Gary was arrested and he was charged. Um, about six months when he was about to be rebailed, um, he called the police and said, I need to um, be re-interviewed. I forgot to tell you something. Um, so the police said, okay, um, come back in. Um, immediately I thought this is just a stalling tactic. Anyway, apparently he sat down in the interview room with the police officers and his lawyer. And uh, they all looked at each other and said, well, what do you want to tell us? And he said, I've already been punished for this. And the police kind of looked in the file and, what do you mean? He said, I was disfellowshipped from the congregation. They said, pardon? He said, yeah, yes, I've already been punished. I was disfellowshipped from the congregation. Right, who was it that disfellowshipped you? So they wrote down the three elders' names. And um, because obviously he had confessed to them. So the police then contacted the congregation, who immediately said, no comment. Don't want to be involved. So the, the police came to me and said, told me this they said but well we've actually got a strong case anyway um, we you know the CPS want to go ahead with this uh, Crown Prosecution gonna go ahead with this um, and by the way this is a, a standard response from Jehovah's Witnesses they were used to it um, then about 11 months after I had disassociated myself uh, before the trial my Mum then found out that I had been disassociated, or I disassociated myself. And she sent me an email and said, this will be the last communication that we have. And she was true to her word. It is a double whammy um, because I was failed as a child and I've been failed as an adult. I've had to go through thera more therapy since um, because it is very, very, very hard. To think that these these people that I grew up with, that I was friends with, people that should have protected me, are, are now wanting nothing to do with me, are treating me as dead. That is, it's an incredible amount of pain.